Chasing the Racing. Powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles. Three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing, episode 168. And we're delighted to be joined by Mark Woodage, aka Brains. And uh, I think most people know you as Brains in the paddock, don't they? Yeah, I think pretty much everybody now, in the paddock does, yeah. I've heard a rumour of how you got Brains. <laughs> straight in there, Chrissy, yeah. straight in there. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that were coming. Where, where did the nickname come from? Um, so I was an apprentice for Frank Roffle, and um, basically, when I was an apprentice, I was, I was, I was useless. I didn't even know what a piston were, a comrade, nothing, and. Um, we were doing some welding one day and he asked me to turn the gas bottles on and kind of messed it all up. I didn't really know which way we're on and off. And he, he just basically says, you're brain dead, you are, you know. <laughs> and and it, it, it kind of went on from that. But at that particular time, we'd just been developing the dinos and stuff. So because I was the only one at college learning and I only knew how to use a computer, I operated the dyno for like three or four years. And then one of our first customers bloke called Nigel Hansen, he'd overheard Fred, uh, Frank calling me sort of brainless and he just called me brains and it just stuck from there then. So That's not the story. I, <laughs> what I, story I, I kind of take it from the dino. Uh, uh, someone told us today that you called brains because it was something to do with um, putting WD-40 on a dino to get be bigger readings. <laughs> no, no. no it, li it literally was because I was a sixteen-year, I was a sixteen-year-old apprentice, and I was useless. Right. And Frank just used to call me brainless. But, 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 but let's go straight into it. How the hell did you get an apprenticeship without knowing what a piston was? <sighs> right. So <laughs> from the beginning, from the beginning, I was at right. school, Preston area, and I was going to be an engineer. So there was British Aerospace, ICI, all them sort of things, and. I was in a geography lesson and that it was the headmaster who were teaching us and after the lesson he said to me there's a guy in your village that's got an engineering apprentice going to do with motorcycles it, it might suit you he says I'm going to put it up on the job board but if you want to um, get his number come up to my office and you can phone him up and you know prehand so I went away and I'm thinking to myself yeah motorbikes this could be a bit of me this so I went upstairs to the headmaster's office to see him and he weren't in but the phone number was on his desk so I thought I've got about 20 minutes here so I grabbed the number went out of school down the road to a phone box called Frank um, we spoke for about five minutes and uh, I actually worked on a toll bridge just down the road from him and I said I'm, I'm on the toll bridge tonight I'll pop in on my way to work so I used to pedal to work popped into Frank's we chatted and he just says I'll be in touch and then about three months later he phoned me up to say that I've got the apprentice and it was mine what okay what what lies did you have during this interview well, I'm just wondering how to, this conversation went about no well <laughs> what do you like motorbikes yeah I love them I've been around them my entire life to, you know? to be fair it wasn't really more about the bikes it was more the engineering but I think what right. what got me the job is I couldn't go and put the phone number back in the headmaster's office, so I had it in my pocket. <laughs> so the headmaster came to me and he said, um, "He said I've I've mislaid that phone number." He says, "I'm going to have to wait for the bloke to call us back because I can't get hold of him." So I got the job, and funnily enough, was sat drinking, and about a year later, and Frank me said to me, "Do you know out of all the people, you're the only person that applied for the job?" And I was like. <sighs> <laughs> Obviously, I was the only one that had the phone number. So, if there's anyone out there going on like indeed.com, you know what I mean? Just just take yeah. some advice here and just nick the and, number. And, 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 and it was just as lucky as that, really. Right yeah. place, right time. And you were with, uh, at Frank's for five, uh, about five years, yeah. yeah like four year apprentice and then sort of like right. moved in. And that's then. essentially where you like learned the trade. And uh, did you go, Everything, did yeah. you go straight into working with it with like a in a race team then or were you always... so when I was with Frank it was from 1992 probably the end of 94 and during during that particular time I had to go at racing myself on a 125 and kind of realized that I weren't going to be very successful at that so I decided to go down the mechanicing route so I was helping um, First of all, I think it was Jamie Robinson when he rode one two fives just weekends because he was one of Frank's customers and asked, "Do you want to come and give me a hand?" So it was him, and then Darren Barton and Greg Ramsey. I did a full year in '94 with Greg, and then because I'd done a full year on the 250 with Greg, um, like weekends, that's when Ian Newton approached me to go full time 
um, to be his sort of mechanic crew chief. And that was his last year of racing in 95. So I looked after him on, on his uh, 250 Aprilia. Left Frank and did that, so yeah. You know, you know how a lot of people, you know, when you like you give up, you hang up the boots kind of element. Was mm. that quite a, an immediate effect for you? You know, when he said, I've been offered this job and you just went, I enjoy this more. Was Did you get more of a kick out of the, the mechanic side and running a team or, you know what I, I mean? It's yeah. for, for me, being a buyer's view, I'd struggle to not ride, if you know what I mean. Mm. It's interesting. I, I enjoyed being around the environment yes. and I liked being with bikes and, and I was just constantly falling off and I wasn't <laughs> very good. So it, it was a no brainer. I thought I kind of <laughs> maybe can make a living out of mechanicking, right? but I'm never going to be very a racer. Honest <laughs> very honest. I know you're, um, <laughs> you obviously live in a similar sort of area as Frank, but if you're closed, it, for people just listening to this mm. podcast rather than actually uh, like watching it on YouTube, you couldn't split the difference between you and Frank Jr. You know, in terms of your accent. You're talking you're unbelievably that. similar. Yeah. And, and I moved over to Yorkshire when I was 30. So I've been in Yorkshire for the last 17 years. So I, I have picked up a different accent as well, but I always tend to go back to my Lancashire accent. <laughs> yeah, there we are. I, I always thought you were from the northeast. Now the reason I'm saying that, mind, is because we're sitting opposite a movie star here, Chrissy, and he's a TT close to the edge. Yeah, yeah like, like yeah, Mark Woodard, JKA brains the whole job lot working for Wilson Craig. We'll talk about that in depth a little bit more. But um, I knew you had a, a a working relationship with like the Gowland family. Yeah. And that, now that's the first time I came across here was at that point I'm thinking, oh, it must be a northeast. Mm. That's how naive I am to race. And I thought, oh, Gowland's northeast. He must be from the northeast. This is how this works. But uh, how did, like, should we just even, that's years down the line. I think we should continue the but story. We've of... got to, like, yeah, Ian Newton. And uh, if Ian Newton, for those that aren't aware, after racing himself, then went on to uh, run the Aprilia Super Teens. He's that's always right. had a, a oh, very tie in with Ian, yeah. with uh, Aprilia. And then uh, from then, he's like, so the likes of Casey Stone and all that came through the Super Teens. He ran that for years and years and years. Since then, he's he's still in the paddock, but running the Aprilias again. But the RSV4s um, in Superstock. So this year, he's got Matt True Love and Tom Ward. But uh, yeah, he's uh, he's been around forever. Is that him? Yeah. yeah, and right. when you're saying uh, you sort of crew chief, like crew chief, don't work for him for that f f uh, year full out, was that in the British Championships or were you doing GPs? Back? British Championship, uh, European and Spanish. It was the Spanish Ducadas Championship there. And was that the first time you'd sort of started travelling with the job as well? Yeah, yeah. I remember the um, first time we went to Spain, he had a big, um, it was a big seven and a half ton, it was big at the time to me, truck. And we crossed over into Dover. And he just says, right, I'm going to sleep now. Pass me the keys. Give me a map because there's no sat navs then. And head for Madrid, and that were it. I was just big <laughs> trucking along, and loving it. <laughs> so you, you know when you let when you left Frank's and you thought, let's go help Newton and stuff like that. Did, did you did you did you have like an idea of what you wanted to achieve at that point, or were, was it quite day by day? Did you think I need I want to be in Worlds and I want to be in GPs? You know, I think you're sitting there now illegally driving a lorry, you know, going mm. into Madrid. Do you yeah. think, oh, how did this happen kind of thing? Um, <laughs> I, I never directly had a plan. I think yeah. the, the year with Ian taught me a lot. He was a he was a, a real hard boss, immaculate with his work. Um, and then at the end of that year, I managed to do a couple of Grand Prix for a team because we met some people in the European Championship. So I did, a, I think, Barcelona at the end of the year for... A, um, a Spanish team. It was a it was a rider called Jose Barresi and teammate with Jurgen van der Goberg. So I got drafted into that team as a one off. And then, obviously, being there, I was like handing my CV out and hope to um right. to stay in Grand Prix. But obviously, it, I didn't do. I then ended up doing a couple more years in the British Championship. So and, uh, when we had Frank on the podcast, we were t he was saying how uh, by the time he came up to sort of learn this trade off his dad, it was it sort of changed to four strokes. So he never really got the chance to get stuck in the two strokes. Mm. But obviously, when you were doing your apprenticeship, it was all two strokes, and like with Ian Newton and stuff. Um, d uh, so presumably, of fr uh, Frank's sort of apprentices apart from yourself as he sort of passed on that knowledge to many other people or is is the only kind of a small do you know what i'm saying yeah no i mean it was all two strokes with frank and obviously i've picked up a lot of that knowledge because i now run my my own two-stroke tuning yeah. shop and is that that's all, all i do is really two strokes is now, that so all the motocross size? that's all the motocross yeah. stuff yeah right and um I, I was just having a quick by the way you're the first person that we've had on the show that's sent the cv over beforehand and i, <laughs> I do you know I, I think that's something that i think i might have to steal off you have have my cv it's ready on whatsapp yeah. so that if i get speaking to someone i can just whiz it over fantastic uh, touch the, the, the only reason i had that is 
I've I've never done a CV. And then at the end of last year when Patronus pulled out, I thought I best make a CV if I want to stay in this paddock. So I did do and handed it out sort of thing. So yeah, mm. I've never really had one because it's always been, you know, in this game, word of mouth, then you finish yeah. with someone, someone else wants you and, and, and that's how it would go. So I've, uh, I've never ever done a CV up until no, that one. On, on your CV, you had something like 27 British motocross titles. Yeah, like yeah. So done the engines for. Yeah, been doing motocross I'm engines since 2010. <laughs> so <laughs> from junior stuff to even some adult stuff now, work with uh, with some pro riders now as well. And do, you, do you get involved? Uh, do you go to the meetings as well, or is it all from the workshop? Yeah, no, I used to do, but not so much anymore now. No, it's all just customer based things. There's a couple of riders that I really do personally look after, and I and I will attend the odd round just to watch them, you know, and be associated with the team, but. I try and stay away because um, if, if I'm honest, I just get I just get swamped. Mm -hmm. People just just wanting information and and it's it's not. Do you know out of uh, so what sort of bikes do you work on? Is it two fifties? Um, what the the, the two strokes to do? Yeah, anything from fifty cc, which is from six to nine year olds, yeah. then they go on to the sixty fives, eighty five small wheel, big wheel, take, one two fives. Take something like a an eighty five, like yep. a, if you took like KEM eighty five for yep. example. From a stock bike to mm -hmm. like fully race prep, ready to go from you, what sort of gains are you looking at, like horsepower? -wise? Um, it's difficult horsepower wise. You're looking at about anywhere between ten and twelve percent gain. So it could, it could be like two to three horsepower. Again, depending on whose dyno you use and what day they dyno it on, and yes, that's a, a grey so area. It, all that. Is it like sort of port and head, the head? What sort of work do you do? Yeah, so I completely strip the engine, um, modify the crankshaft slightly just to give it a crankcase volume. Pack um, the crankcases, glue them, reshape and machine them, do the cylinder, and then put a different cylinder head on it or a machine cylinder head on. Um, sometimes modify the carb and then exhaust here's a, here's a question how do they police motocross in tuning wise um they don't any anything goes tuning the only police bore and stroke so it has to be an 85 cc that's what i mean so but like obviously like british for example you've got the rolling road you know if anyone gets you know accused mm. off or anything like that or yeah. they get is it the pop, their top three that get a dyno you mean the bsb bsb wise oh um is it, is it yeah. normally random the, checks yeah random but, the checks, but yeah. like in motocross like you see you get an 85 and bore out or 105 mm. but there's no way is that even in British level? Like we don't know a lot about. They must have like, some sort of technical. They must be. They yeah, must but be. They, they do, but they don't. It's only oh, if someone right. really, really protests, they'll pull that engine to bits. But it's it's do very rare. To, do they have to pay for that protest? Um, I think they might have yeah. to. Yeah, because like in, like in roads and stuff, you have to pay for yeah. that, which is well, which a, is a lot of the time. It. A lot of the time in racing in general, you have to put money up. But if there ah. is a problem, you mm. get your money back. So if you're confident that someone is cheating, it you can put like five hundred quid over. But if they do find something, you get that money back. Yeah. Um, as well as uh, prepping the motocross bikes, and it's sort of motocrossy. Mm. Not quite. Uh, I seen on your Instagram that you also prep Jake Dixon's bike for the uh, Valentino Rossi's ranch. Yeah, uh, the flat track bikes. Do you, I've right. actually converted my uh, 450 into a flat tracker like a few right. years ago. Probably not to the same spec as what you do. Then to be fair, but um, do you do much of that? Uh, much of that work? Uh, we do. We did. Um, obviously, I was with Jake last year, and uh, and he got the invite to the ranch, and we had about two weeks to build him a bike. Um, and we actually went with a 250 Honda. And it was only because they were available. Um, four stroke or two stroke? Uh, four stroke. Right. So it was a 250, uh, CRF 250. Yeah. Bro. And um, so all we did is lower the suspension, sprung it, long gearing, and um, like obviously made it look nice and shiny. And yeah, it, it was good. It, it, it was good. Was, was Jay competitive? He that? was very competitive. It was really, really good. When, when, as, as we arrived there, we were speaking to like McPhee and Chaz Davis and they said, if you get within seven seconds of valet, um, you're doing good. So, you know, if, if you're not within seven seconds, don't be alarmed. They're fast. And I think by the end of the weekend, Jake was within 2.8 of him. And Jesus. when you analyse the sectors, he was losing 2.2 .2 of that on the two big long straights because they were on all on 450 MRs. So we've, we've already, um, we already spoke at the MotoGP last week that and um, we're trying to get a double entry for a lad who who I work with on on the movie side, Kieran and Jake, and we're going to build um, two proper four fifties this year, and we're going to go and have a, a have good a go at it. Go. Try and have a go at them. Nice. Yeah. Have we? And, um, go on. Sorry, I was about to say how 
How do you get an entry to the ranch? Is it die and easy? Is um, it like invent, like, invite only. It's, it's invite, invite only, only, yeah. Is yeah. that because of your relationship? No, it was Jake that got the invite. I right. just built the bike. He was teammates but of it last year. Obviously, Johan Stiggerfeld, who who ran the Patronus, is now director of the VR46 team. Is he? Yeah, I so I've been right. spe- I was speaking with Stiggy at, um, at Stig. the GP to get Kieran an entry. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, How do we get an entry? Come on, uh, let's no, yeah. Now you've brought the, the Kieran Clark <laughs> yeah. thing up. So uh, Kieran used to race himself yes. and is now a stunt rider in like loads of movies. Yeah, and obviously you work, that's right. work pretty closely with him. Oh, and right. um, that's be, that, I guess that's kind of uh, an avenue of the engineering thing that you never want. When you like started out at Frank's, mm. you never thought that would that would op- that them doors would open. Yeah. When no. did when did they open and what sort of? Um, I, know, I know some of the movies you've worked on, but like tell us about what movies. And- so Kieran were on. I think his first one might have been uh, Mission Impossible Five as a stunt rider, and he became quite close with a with a stunt director, and then what he had to do a stunt where he went down some stairs with a camera on the tank, and literally this was just bungee straps, duct tape, trying to hold the camera and he had to ride it. So we kind of came up with the idea, let's make a camera bike, a bike specifically to do the job. Um, so And that's what we're about doing. And then he he goes then and, and rents it to movies so he can put a camera on the front, follow a chase scene or, or whatever he's got to do. And, and we engineered that and then that's grown into building like an off-road camera bike and other camera bike. And then obviously it's expanding now that side of things as well. So right yeah. so it's all tied in with key running you yeah so, sort of so all i did for a couple of years is just build the bikes and didn't actually do anything but then um i think it was 2018 he got he got a call to do um um star wars uh, the last star wars film and he says i've got to take down an assistant basically assistant was just me putting it on the stand every time he was done with it um and i was like i'm the assistant because i'm a massive star wars fan <laughs> So I was like, great. So we, we went down to Caddington Studio, it were. They'd built um, a massive set inside there, which was meant to be one of the, um, not the Death Star, but but one of the, the big ships sort of thing. And it was the scene where the horses are running down with the rebels and that. And oh. because we had an electric camera bike, we could get right in the horses with a camera and actually film them without spooking disturbing, the yeah, spooking the horses. Um, so we did a couple of weeks down there, you know, and I turned up just as a, as an assistant. And then when I got there, like, um, I had to sign this Disney George Lucas thing and contract. I was proper contracted, and it was amazing. I met all the actors and came back with loads of souvenirs. It was just, you know, I was just did great. It, did I know it shit all over, oh, shit all over MotoGP. Like, oh, there's Valentino, there's so and so. No, it was. I mean, the actual work was boring. There's a lot of hanging around, and you're waiting to be called. But I was just just watching how I, how they just bring it all together was just I, amazing for me. I know this is an incredibly personal question and mm. you shouldn't be, I shouldn't be asking this, but in the world of movie magic, you know, like things like millions and millions and millions of pounds, for you to essentially hold a paddock stand, how, how much did you get paid? Yeah, quite a lot of money, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. You know, you know when yeah. you think about oh, like yeah. they just put price think, tags on things. You know what I mean? Know, That's like, class. You no, know, like some of these movies. So, like if you think a movie, you when you hear about like say what an actor or an actress gets paid for doing a role mm-hmm. you yeah, think yes. how on earth but then do you know when you add up all the revenue of all the cinema all the dvd all mm. the merchandise all the things there's some movies can turn over like either hundreds of millions or billions and then you think well to pay like a top actor a couple of million quid to do it mm. it's like unbelievably good do you know what i mean so they do it does cost a fortune to make movies but then obviously <laughs> there's yeah. mark well, every, single per- charge every single person every single person at the cinema to watch a movie i mean what's what's it to go to the cinema now like about eight quid or something I have no idea more than that now, about 14 40 sure. there's like thousands yeah, and thousands so. yeah so it's, it's a good business well, to be in what was the last film you went to watch um I've made this in eight no me uh, like one, one of the Avenger films not right. that too long ago Right. I think it might have been um, sp- the last Spider-Man one. Right. There we so, sorry, we interrupted there. Give us a So you've sort of been involved with Mission Impossible, Star Wars, is anything else? Um, we, the bikes we did, um, uh, Fast and the Furious, Black Widow. Um, obviously, we've just been working. We've, we've just literally closed last week on, on another movie. Um, but that's, that's very secretive. Yeah. Come on. Now there's a lot of things that no one listens to the show. You know, <laughs> God, God. Yeah, I've got a disclosure. Until it's out in the cinema in July, we can't really discuss too much. But it's it's been a big part of the company that, is and it, when it? it comes out, it's it will be big because it's um, 
it's obviously an actor doing a stunt and it's going to be the biggest stunt that's come out of Hollywood. And yeah, can, it's you, a can you make the it, bike for us? Is it? Sort of. <laughs> Can't really say too much. But is yeah. it a fresh film or is it like a franchise? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a continuation of something. Oh, yeah. All right. Mm. But, and we'll come to which actor it is. <laughs> I'm not sure. I know I am sworn to see this. Yeah, we'll leave that. Yeah, action film, yeah. fantasy. It's an action film. Action. Yeah, it's, it'll be good. It's um, the, the, the trailer. The trailers and stuff are already out for it. Oh. Um, but they only finished filming literally last week in the Lake District. That were it done. So now they've got to put it all together and. That's ideal for you. Did you pick the scene? Did you? Oh, I know a cracking spot in the lake. So just no, outside of Garstang there. What it were most of the um, most of it was filmed in Norway. All right. Through COVID, because um, we started filming it in 2020, we did. We started all the training and, and the filming, and with COVID, stopped, started, stopped. And they, they've still got things they have to finish. So they go to other locations that's more convenient, that looks like where they yes. were, you know, and then a bit of movie magic, blend it all in. And so that's done now. So that there should be are. out in July. Once that's out in July, um, the photos, the footage, and, and everything we can put out there. That, that's the biggest thing we've ever done. So, Our dedicated listeners yeah. are chasing the race. And they'll be looking forward to yeah. July now. They'll be like, what the hell is this film? Yeah. They'll be like, looking for us. So they'll be looking for it. <laughs> so, um, where did we get to in, the, yeah, in terms of the Madrid, racing? Back, we got yeah, yeah, back Madrid, to uh, yeah. Ian Newton and then a little bit of um, working for a GP team in Spain. I know quite early on in your career you worked for John McGuinness. Yeah. Uh, 97. 97, yeah. So again, it was it was the link we're working with Ian on the Aprilia. Um, we, we were quite dominant in the British Championship, Ian, we're on the Aprilia. And, Would you like to kind, of, uh, kind of retrench you? Or you, you, you I'm right with this. One, I, so I will, white I will have one for later, though. Oh, uh, spot on, yeah, grab black one. one. Black Please. one. Black Ridge yeah. Energy there. What you have to do? I'll go chuck us a black and go on then. Thank you. Cheers. Um, so yeah, sorry for interrupting that. So yeah, the, the, the Aprilia was becoming the more common common bike to have. It was better than the, the Yamaha and 100, not done so much with their RS. Um, so in 96, Callum Ramsey, he had an Aprilia for an Irish team. So I kind of ran that Aprilia and then Paul Bird got one for John McGuinness. So um, I was with McGuinness in 97. That was a good year, that, because John won his first ever British Championship race that year. Um, it was his second year of, at the TT, and we decided to take the Aprilia. Um, and we, we got his first ever podium, oh. which was good. Was and, that the Vimto bike then? No, it was the Vimto the year after. It was like silver and red it were. Right. Um, just a PBM motorsport bike it were. Right. It, was, it was lovely. It Have were. you got any tips for um, to for fine tuning a 250 around the around the island? Because Dom's at Dom's uh, going next him. week yeah. and uh, is uh, running number. We've spoke about it quite a few I mean, times I'm, on the podcast about being the you know the first on the road and it's it'll be quite an achievement mm. for Dom. So congrats, yeah, it's good. congratulations about I'm, that. I'm, I'm actually jealous to be fair because the the 250s are by far the best bikes I've I've ever worked on. Really, you know, throughout all the bikes I've i've worked with the 250s are still the best and then um, i've done many a tts on them and that so lots personally of, no working on them yeah oh, right. lots of early morning practices and late practices and stuff i mean the the uh, the year uh, in 97 with john mcginnis um we took a ian give us a 125 apilia like a factory apilia got from from italy and we could not get a lap out of that bike um it just kept Past Union Mills, it seize. So well, a little far, bit further, it? it would seize, and we were trying to figure it out. And, and in the end, we ended up um, ended up cross hatching all the pistons, giving a lot more clearance. And I remember this one morning practice. Um, Paul had one of them new StarTap mobile phones. So back in '97, they were it were rare to have a mobile phone, and it was rare to have the little flip StarTap one. So he said to John, "Take my phone, and if you break down." call us and we'll come and get you because because you, you've got to wait till practice is finished to know exactly where they were back yeah, then as well yeah, there was yeah. no communication so john had this little zip in his leathers and he put birdie star tack in and away he goes on this one two five <laughs> we waited about 22 minutes and he says come on we'll go to the wall see if we can see if he's coming you know and then all of a sudden we could hear this aprilia come in and john literally came past the start finish like that and went to do a second lap and we were like we've done it um anyway came back two laps well happy with the bike would fix the problem and paul just said can i have my phone back please and john went yep and in the wind the leathers had blew up and birdie's phone were gone 
<laughs> it was devastated. Uh, can, can I just say, imagine... I wonder if there's someone out there with that phone now. Do you know, imagine, never turned up. Imagine trying to explain to someone now that, like, say, um, my little sister, for example, who's just grown up in a world of, a world of iPads and all of yeah. the iPhones and stuff. Like, that's just the norm. Imagine, not that long ago, like, it was, like, mega rare for someone to have a... Like, think... People used to go race at the TT, and if they broke down, they would just had to like wait and like you'd you take it for granted now, don't you? Like mobile phones, mm. it's such an obvious thing. Where like back then, it's like I know the, the, it would you had to literally you could be waiting ages to be told that your bike had broke down, or you know there were there were there were not a great deal of communication, you know. So it were. Uh, yeah, what was funny? <laughs> were you there, like standing like perfectly there next to Birdie, going, "Can I have your phone back?" What was Birdie's reaction to that? Oh, he was mortified because, and, al- and also, he was in the Isle of Man, so we couldn't get a replacement or anything. So we were there a week now without a mobile phone because they, you couldn't just go and get a phone, you know. So. Yeah, and, that uh, is class. and speaking yeah. of the... John, probably sold it. Let's be honest. He probably <laughs> pulled in and just went, "Yeah, give us a couple of hundred quid for that." I'll put the car be all right. Speaking of the classic TT, obviously that's coming up next week. Um, you yourself going over on the two fifty yeah. and also. Uh, classic F1, yeah. Um, Seven fifty Bob Henderson's bike, absolutely mm-hmm. cracking thing, and uh, also the Davies uh, Yamaha five hundred. Okay. So, have you, have you done many classic TTs before? No, I went to watch one in twenty sixteen, um, and I only really went to watch just for to see Bruce on the two fifty. Yeah. <laughs> I hope yeah. he's there this year. I've heard a rumor that he's not there. No, no, but, he's put an entry in, but you yeah. see, well, you see, the Padgett slot aren't doing it. Right. So Clive, uh, sorry, not Clive. Um, Connor Cummins isn't there. And David Todd's not there. Right. I'm surprised that they might turn up with a small van just for him. Well, hope, I'm, I'm really hope, hopeful on that because obviously Davey's doing really well in the yeah. the Superstock Thousand Championship, and oh, yeah. Connor's obviously wanting to do um, you know, get track time doing mm. that as well. So they're going to be a miss, but be interesting because Clive likes to keep his finger on the pulse, doesn't he? So it's either he can't be in two places at once, but. No. Mm. I, because like you say, Bruce Anstey on one of those, it's just, it just might yeah. as well engrave the trophy. If, you know yeah. what I mean? It's Have you often... ever had the chance to work with Bruce? Uh, I haven't, no. It's no, uh... not Bruce, no. Uh-huh. It's, uh... Uh, saying that, who's, who's been your dream person to work with? Or have you worked with that person? Um, Dream person? Yeah, like, you know, you just thought, I'd really like to work with them. Famous or not famous, if you know what I mean. Someone like Bruce, you know. Yeah, I don't know, to be honest with you. Hmm. Um... I think it was it was a little bit surreal last year being in the same environment as Valentino. That was uh, that, you know, even, every time he walked in the hospitality and just sat there, it was still like that's Valentino Rossi, <laughs> and and and, um, and he has that effect everywhere he goes. Do you uh-huh. know what I mean? Even even no matter how many times you say hello to him, it's still that, that was class. probably the most. How how did that job come about then? Because like you say, you went from like handing out your your CV at British. Yep. Going around just getting the word around. So how? What, what was the story? We we, we kind of got stuck with the story, you know, driving a truck through Madrid, you know, and then you, you went into worlds at that point, wasn't it? So yeah. So doing Europeans in ninety five, ninety six, and we did a few in ninety seven. Yeah. Um, Stiggy was riding a, a two fifteen European, and we just got friendly. We used to just hang out, um, same sort of age, and and we just got friendly. Uh, and then in 98 and 99, I did 500 Grand Prix. So in 98, I was Scott Smart's crew chief. And then 99, I was Rutt's crew chief when he rode the 500 Grand Prix. Um, and again, I just, we just, there were, there were, back then there weren't so many um, easy jet flights or Ryanair. So we literally, we traveled in the truck and then stayed between races. So we'd race in Spain and then the next one might be Mugello. So we'd just go and spend a week in Rimini. And we literally, we just stayed in Europe for like six months. So I hung out with Stiggy. So we, we got a really good friendship. And then throughout 2000 and stuff, I'd go and visit Grand Prix and always made sure I'd go and say hello to him. And then as we got to like 2010, 11, he was, um, he was starting to then um, run some teams and he was on the phone would be interested in working for him. and. This went on for a couple of, couple of years. We were looking after Louis Salam and he wanted me to go and uh, do a GP there with him and it never happened. And then he was talking to me for a year saying, I'm, I'm making this uh, Moto2 team. It's going to be Caterham and you know, I want you as one of the crew chiefs. And then eventually it just happened. 
And then that team then became the Malaysian Sepang team. And, and I was with Stiggy for nine years then. So. Nine years? Yeah. Uh, at what nine point years. in your career did you ring Frank Frank up and say, I'm not doing bad for being brainless, am I? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, still not a bit. I, to be honest, I've not seen Frank now for about, probably about four or five years. I used to go over quite a lot and see him because my parents are from there. Um, but he's... Um, kind of like semi-retired now so he spends quite a lot of time abroad and stuff but yeah. I obviously see Frank Jr quite a lot you know so um I could do with really going over to see Frank to be fair and yeah catch up again because he was um yeah it was it, 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 quite a big mentor for me because obviously he taught me everything and and he ended up like a best mate and a father figure you know when I got married I asked him to be my best man and this you know he was Frank for me just taught me everything mm -hmm. you know so he is was, it no um often people people talk about apprentice apprenticeships and there's like a big debate about like how what minimum wage should be for apprenticeships but do you know if you think of like how valuable those four years were for yourself mm. and like what that then propelled you on to it even if you were paying to get that experience it would have been like the best oh, yeah, money no, that mean, you could ever spend so like that you know it's often if you put like a minimum wage on apprenticeships then people wouldn't walk, like say frank mm. had to pay you like a um 10 pound an hour back then you wouldn't have been worth 10 pound an hour so therefore you would never have got that opportunity where do you know what i'm saying yeah, it's yeah. like now my my apprentice i got 27 pound 50 a week yeah. for the first year and then i got a pay rise to like 33 pounds or something like I say, even if you but, uh, even was, if you got amazing. paid nothing yeah. it was like it's given you the the exactly. platform to then go on and you know, you know literally working for two months there um so it was 1990 one of my first big trips was two weeks at the isle of man so it was like right pack a bag we're, we're working on the isle of man so we had we had a lot of sidecar customers then um you know tz 350 engines and the crowds of 500 and so a lot of his customers were sidecar people because he was an ex sidecar racer himself so we went over to look after sidecar people you, you, know? you still do quite a lot of sidecar engines to this yeah day, I, st I still i still um look after tim reeves and that mm -hmm. um for the last year since he's been on the yamaha um i haven't done his engines but all the time throughout the um from 12 or 13 onwards i think it was 12 onwards i did his engines so i was i was with the wilson craig team and i think it was the year he rode for nick crow so it was after nick's injury yeah um and he just he just weren't getting anywhere he weren't doing a lap and mm. i remember he just come in the awning and um and he's like right which one's brains and it's like and he says right i want you to build me an engine and i'm like well you need to ask wilson because so and he sorted it out and i says well what we're doing and he came in with all these cbr 600s just in bits and he says i want you to build me one engine out of that and i was like for tomorrow morning so he went off to kfc and he got a, a big bucket of chicken and says right we're doing the night shift so we kind of made the best out of everything we had put an engine together um, put it in his outfit and he went and finished third never and yeah and um i think that was his first podium and then that was it since then i've just had to build all of his engines since then so yeah in a good do, you, do you regret building that engine i'm joking i'm joking <laughs> good customer well. do you know what he's a good lad yeah you know we've, we, we 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 had a we've had a great friendship out of it so have, have, have you met tim reeves yeah yeah so, I've, i like I've, he's one of them characters I've, I've only bumped into him hello tim that i never I don't know I'll if you know what I mean. I'd love to get him on the show at some point. It would be good, actually. It would be good. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to like keep it in order, so because we're like <laughs> no, 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 everywhere. Right. Yeah, no, you mentioned about the Wilson Critic thing, yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah. yeah. And obviously go. that was on the that uh, coincided around 2010, I think, close at the edge. Is it around that? Yeah. Um, I've done a little bit with Wilson before that because he ran. He were teamed up with someone. Um, I can't remember his Was name. that the Cameron Donald days? Yeah, the Cam when Cameron Donald first came over, Wilson and somebody else looked after Cameron, didn't they? <sighs> so I did the odd event just trying to... They bought X Honda bikes, and at that time, I was at Honda. <laughs> so I right. I looked after, like... I was with the Red Bull rookies. Um, so I looked after Eugene. There was Eugene and Johnny Ray, and we, they were on the two strokes, and then they went to the Super Sport. So then I had to do the TT with McGuinness on the Super Sport. And then Wilson bought them bikes. So he would always phone me for advice and things. And that's how I got to meet Wilson and meet Cameron. And then that developed into him breaking from who he was with to run Cameron alone and and, uh, and asked if I'd just do the roads with him. So whatever what? I was doing at the time, I did the roads as well. What an incredible, like, Roller coaster of paddocks, <laughs> you know what I mean? You've gone from Moto G, like, yeah. you know, like Moto GP, Moto like the 500 GP bikes, where you know, mm. low zips, hairy chests, and cigarettes, and like shagging other men's wives and stuff like that. To 
Welcome to Northern Ireland, son. This is the panic. That, that might be your you. experience. Oh, oh. <laughs> have you not seen Five Hundred Days and Son? It was like I wish if I could pick a time era. If you're not seeing the Unridables, it's classic. Yeah. Just one of the punchy. Mm. I bet that us. was uh, Michael's fault because I was with <laughs> I was with Rutter on the Five Hundred, and then he wanted to come back to British Superbikes, so he ended up riding the uh, Renegade Ducati team, and I ended up being his crew chief on the Ducati. So that was my introduction into four strokes, and the and back into the British Championship. So I was with Michael for two years on that. So we did all the Macau's and I think we did the North, we did do the Northwest and, and obviously the British Championship. And then he went to Honda UK for the HM plant and wanted to take me to Honda. So I went with him to Honda, but when they like interviewed me at Honda, all my background was two stroke and they went, we've got just the project that you can run. And they were running the Red Bull Rockies two stroke, one, two fives, Eugene Laverty, Sam Neat. Um, so I got, put in charge of that and then I went with Eugene up onto the Super Sport stayed in and stayed on Honda mm -hmm. right and then obviously from the Honda I went into World Super Sport with with Jonesy and then Sam Lowe's Ellison and the PTR thing was yeah through PTR. who was the so, biggest pair of the arse out of them list <laughs> out of all the riders yeah out of that list yeah pain in the ass I don't know none of them are really oh, come on. pain in the ass to be fair <laughs> oh good lads yeah Michael was a pain there we are. Cool. <laughs> and obviously, so when you stepped across to World Super Sport, uh, was that initially with Craig Jones, did you say? Yeah, so I left Honda at the end of 2006 and I actually went back to Grand Prix. So I got a job for Ilmore GP. I was Jeremy McWilliams' crew chief on the MotoGP Ilmore. But we only did one round and then the team folded. Um, so basically, to design the engine around a a car engine because um, it was Mario Illen um, who was the engine designer and, and it was so fast but the crank was so small it had no inertia and the riders couldn't control it so all the electronics we were introducing to control the, the wheelie and stuff was taking all the power away so they came right. to the conclusion that they needed a bigger crankshaft and to come up with a bigger crankshaft they needed different crankcases, different design, different chassis so it just got canned, like literally one round in. So then I was um, probably about April time without a job. Went back to see Neil Tuxworth. Um, he were going to put me, I think, with uh, Leon Cameo as his engine builder or something. And then Gary Ackerold had phoned me, who was running Craig in World Supersport, and said, we need a crew chief. So I just went straight to the Jonesy outfit in 07. We had a really successful year, got a few podiums. And then in 2008, we built the PTR team, got a sponsor from Portugal and, and built that around around Craig and Miguel was his teammate. So. Mm. But how, how, like, you know, it's interesting, we obviously we get a lot of people listening to this show and, you know, there'll be people who want to be the next Mark. You know, has there ever been any point in your career where you've been jobless for a while? Because it's a niche market, this sport, you know, like it is, motorcycle racing in general, and there's only so many jobs at your level, mm. isn't it? You know, it's. Have you I, ever been I think worried? I've been very lucky, to be fair. Yeah. I think 2000 and, uh, 2012, mm. I started the year without a race team. I was focusing on my company then, right. and I was just I was just going to commit to do the roads with um, Wilson. So it was Cameron and William, um, and then about four or five rounds in, um, again Gary Ackerold for me, who was managing the Swan Yamaha team, and asked right. what I'd just do weekends only BSB which worked perfect for me and then look after Nori Haga so came back again <laughs> I feel like it's going to be a quiz at the end of this with all these names it's a hell of a list my yeah, Jesus and, and then so, um, so, sorry going back to the World Super Sport day so when yep. you just uh, transferred over and we're working with Craig Jones obviously Craig um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the fairly uh, passed mm. away at Brands Hatch in 2008 and uh, as a as a rising star of of that era there was like a lot of really top British lads coming through mm -hmm. um, you know like with the you, the pictures of them always get shared like completely sideways into you know like in, mm. in the druids and stuff and he had a fantastic style and I think obviously t tipped to be to go right to the top of the sport was um was that the first time that you'd been in like closely involved with a rider that had passed away or was it had happened before? Um, unfortunately it had happened before. I was quite close to Mick Lofthouse when, when, when he got TT. killed at the mm -hmm. TT. That was that was the first one and that was I mean that was heartbreaking that. Yeah. Um and then B 
being part of the Honda Association, we lost young Chris Jones at Cadwell mm. on the 125. Um, but but Craig was by far the closest. He, he, he was my best mate. Yeah. You know, I worked with him, but we were, you know, it was, uh, yeah, that was a shame. And then uh, d did you um, did you work the rest of that season? Um, yeah, I went over and, and looked after Miguel, the teammate. Um, the only ran the one bike for a couple of rounds, and then we got an American. I think it was Josh Hayes over um, to. Um, sit on Craig's bike for the I think the last two rounds it were mm -hmm. but I continued to work with Miguel because uh, it was his sponsor um, the team and Craig were really close with Miguel and the sponsor so I felt it was right that you know yeah. I, I looked after Miguel you know so yeah it was a uh, it was difficult but I'm really close with um, Craig's father Steve you know and it was their blessing that the team continued you know and um, yeah it, it, it's difficult to do you know but like Craig wouldn't have wanted anything different, you know. Yeah. He would have put his helmet on and still rode, you know. So it it, it, it were hard, but yeah, we we, we continued, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned the, the working with the Wilson Greg team, obviously with William Dunlop and Cameron Donald. Did did your time there coincide with Guy Martin as well? Yeah. Yeah. So that was just pre them. It was. Uh, that was the close to the edge film. Yeah. Mm. There, yeah, that was two thousand and ten. One. What? Because uh, from that film, you sort of get the idea that um, guy was trying to be as much of a sort of privateer as it, like doing as much as he could himself. Did were you officially crew chief them then, or what was the involvement? Yeah, the TT. It was. Um, it was quite. Do you know? It was really enjoyable actually working with guy, because he's quite technical and um, and we had the data. Excuse me. We um, we managed to get some onboard footage, and we watched um, some onboard footage from McGuinness, and then overlaid it to the data. And when he went out in that last senior race, um, he was on it. He were on it, and he'd learnt so much from the data and the onboard footage. He knew exactly what we were doing wrong, and it and it just clicked. And right, he were on to win that day, you know. And it was a shame. Yeah. Obviously, he crashed, didn't he? But. Um, yeah, it was just dead interesting working with what, him. Cause he crashed through Ballas, Balagari, Balagari. Didn't he? Yeah. What happened? Did he just run out of road? Or? I think it was. Um, he just he just come out of the pit, so full tank of fuel, and he and he just he just folded the front going in. Oh. Going in. Yeah. But yeah. Kind of a little bit round, wasn't it? Because he he I think he just hit the the bales and then just stayed central in the middle of the road so he was very lucky yeah. very lucky I, I watched uh, this, uh, this this year at the TT yeah. just on the entry and uh, yeah it's just quite yeah. crazy, crazy fast yeah, yeah it's fast so what was obviously uh, you know when did, when did we lose Wilson um, Three, when, it was during Covid right yeah I think it, I think it was during Covid it might have been 20 mm. yeah that's terrifying isn't it what was, yeah. was, what was he like to work with yeah all oh, right I mean, for his age and everything, he was he was in the gym every day as, as fit as anything he were, and a really really typical Irish person, but ever so Stubborn. nice. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> just so passionate, you know. Just yeah, did you desperate to win a TT? Were mm. just just shame that never actually happened for him, you know, because that's that's all he wanted was to win a TT. And since working, and we came so close. Oh yeah, especially with, with Cameron. I think the 20, 2012 we finished second in every race. Oh, yeah, and then we went into the senior, and um, on the Wednesday night practice, um, we got a hole through the radiator at Windy Corner, so we he pulled off. But if you took all his sectors, we were we were going to do one hundred and thirty three mile an hour that night in practice, and he were having it and they, they said to John that he were getting beat in the senior and it rained and it got cancelled so we never got to do it oh. <laughs> yeah so close yeah, um, <laughs> since working with Wilson Craig have you been back to the TT often or um, has it been, been mainly focusing on the GP side of things I, I haven't been um, you must get off as well since I can't remember last time I was there maybe 17 and who was that with, with Swan was it um, no spectating Oh, right. So, uh, sorry, I meant since, uh, when was the last time you worked there? At the TT. So, um, I was always showing a face, just looking after Tim, but not really working. The last year, I think, was, I'm trying to think, 13, might have been 14 when Cameron rode the Norton. Mm -hmm. He asked me oh, to huh? He asked me to go and look after him on the Norton. Yeah. Well, does, it <laughs> does, it, does, it, does it interest you now? The, What's that? So we we're going to say the bike, the, the bike was awful. 
Um, that particular bike where, yeah, it was it was like kind of the very first year they put a real good rider on it. And it's, um, I think they just put the Aprilia engine in yeah. and um, it had road discs on it and stuff and the discs were warping and there were just lots of things that, that needed iron, ironing out and that. And uh, so that was the first year. And then Cameron stayed to do a second year with them. Mm. Did um, but, do, you, do you miss the TT? Um, like working there? Yeah, even though I've not been there, but whether I've been in it normally clashes with like Mugello or somewhere, I'd always have them, um, you know, the live timing on and always watch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do like it. You must get job offers though, every year. Yeah, I've just, to be fair, I've just sat in a meeting with Dean Harrison this afternoon. He wants just to do something with him next year, but Interesting. It's, um, it all depends on, on my business more than anything, yeah. really. And, yeah, time scale, fair enough. So, so um, in this, uh, in the running order, so when you went to work for Stiggy for nine years, what what year, what um, period was that? Got that on. was 2013 till end of last year. Right, okay. So run us through um, the, the, like the, te the teams that sort of... Uh, like the sponsors that you've had in through that time and which riders have you worked with through there through the stiggy period yeah so it started as caterham so we was the motorcycle team to the formula one team um it was based at the caterham factory where the formula one team were which country is that um it was in the uk was it? yeah um caterham kit cars so, yeah they, they have the sub branch which is kit car but they actually they did have a formula one team for a few years right there we are um and it was owned and funded by the guy that owns Air Asia, so it had Malaysian links. Yeah, um, it, we were sponsored by Air yeah, Asia. Yeah, they were they were white bikes with the red logo on. So that was that was Zarko and uh, Josh Herring. Then Caterham Formula One folded, hence the bike team had to fold. Um, so the Malaysian Razlan was the team was the principal of Sepang Circuit. He he was paying for. Um, uh, Fami, one of the Malaysian riders, to ride in various teams. So he said he'd buy the team and put it in Moto 3 as a Moto 3 start. So they, we then became um, a Malaysian Sepang back team. Uh, and we had uh, Fami, and, and then we got a European rider to sort of get the results, which were Jakob Kornfell. So we did that in a KTM in 15, switched to Hondas in 16, and then we changed Fami to. Adam Noradin, which was another Malaysian. Um, and then Jakob moved on and then we got Ayuma Sasaki. Uh, we did, I think we did two years with Ayuma and then he went on to Adam's bike and then we got McPhee. Um, and then it was, and then in the final year it was McPhee and Binder. And then obviously while that was going on, mm -hmm. they'd, they'd had a Moto2 team and built a MotoGP team. During which... that, so during that time, have, have you always been a crew chief to one of the riders or have you been sort of team principal? Or... From 15 onwards, I was like technical director of the Moto3 team. So I kind of overlooked both riders and uh, liaised with HRC on all the spares and the development parts and, and then specifically looked after the rider that I was assigned to on a weekend. And then half, and halfway through, was it last year when you were... Uh, you were working on the Moto 3 side you yeah. then jumped in and uh, you like yeah, so, switched with Dixon's yeah so I was I was McPhee's crew chief um, John weren't having a great season and Jake was having a, a torrid season and I think at that point Jake was about to quit really? Um, and he right. says I need a change in my team so Stiggy got us in the office and he says look I can bring in this Spanish crew chief and there's an Italian crew chief that needs a job he says but I keep bringing in crew chiefs he says, it's just not working for Jake. He said, so I need someone in there with eyes to tell me what's going on. He said, so I'm going to put you in there for the rest of the year. And I was like, Chat. I, 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 well, no, I was shocked to be fair, yeah. because I was enjoying my relationship and the work with John. Yeah. And although at the end of that year, I wanted to go motor two. So he's saying to me, go motor two now, um, learn the Morelli, because at the end of that year, there's a chance that we're going to put Dixon on the motor GP bike and you can go with Dixon to MotoGP right. so I had six months to learn Morelli and, and, and do that but then obviously at the end of the year Patron's pulled out Yeah. so it never happened anyway and so. you, you, was that I a could, shock to you as well? Like well Patron was, was pulling out yeah was that just was that kind of a, a slow bit like a big sponsor like that and going to the team like was it a, a build up? yeah, yeah. It, it was a shock to everybody really yeah. because it, it happened I remember it was in Austria um, and two weeks before everybody was um getting ready to sign contracts and we kind of knew what was happening and, yeah. and, it, and it happened really quick 
I think it was in the summer break. Um, there was a bit of conflict with uh, with Razlan and Petronas in Malaysia, and kind of a fallout. Right. So Petronas just went pulled out. Yeah, you came uh, very close with Jake to getting a race win. Uh, the, that second half of the season, didn't you? That was it. In the, the French, was it, yeah, that damn race. No, that was a uh, that was, that that was in his first year. Oh, was yeah, it? Okay. I wasn't with oh, Jake. That was heartbreaking. That, yeah, that was heartbreaking. Do you know, in terms of um, obviously McPhee's being on the sort of mo- either one two five or Moto three class mm. since uh, I think around sort of two thousand and eight. So I'll be coming yep. up fourteen years in that so, same mm-hmm. sort of class, and. I th- has he had, has he had an opportunity in Moto Two and then come back, or has he always never been to Moto Two? Yeah, no. Moto Three, and um, just a, a bit of a random one. But do you know if if for example he doesn't get the chance to stay in the Moto GP paddock after this year, mm-hmm. and he say came back to, um, let's just say if he got a ride in British Superbikes, where would you expect McPhee to fare in Super? BSP? Ah, I like it. It's difficult. John's a very good rider. Uh, He's very talented. His his setup's really good. He's aware of everything. It's hard to say on the motor three bikes because the 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 way the motor three style's gone the last three years, mm. I don't think it develops them that much for the bigger bikes sure. afterwards. You know, um, so, uh, I think so, it'd be a good super sport rider though. Yeah, right. That yeah. corner speed. And... Yeah, I think if he got a world super sport rider, competitive bike, it'd be top three. Yeah, mm-hmm. he, and I think a that's. Good rider. I remember. Uh, after Danny Webb had been in that in the one two fives for a while, and mm. Moto three, uh, he had a few good years, and well, he went British Super Sport, but then World Super Sport, and quite a few other people do similar sort of. Routes. Yeah, I think if if you were if you were say managing John and he didn't have an opportunity in Moto two, I think World Super Sport would definitely be the best. That'd be probably route. the next place he'd look. Yeah, and then if not there, probably here. Yeah, British, as in British Super Sport, he'd probably got Superbike, Superbike. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. And I just uh, yeah. would He's, you have, he trains on an R one, so. You know, he can yeah. he can ride a bigger bike. Yeah. Know, yeah. So. How do you how, in your opinion, do you think Skinner got on? Because we were talking about Lee Jackson, yeah. weren't we? You know, the fact of like, will coming back from that Moto Two ride hindrance him for this weekend mm. or vice versa? What mm. what's what's your opinion on that? I, I actually think he did all right. I think um, he did brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It's, Cons- it's, a, it's a tough class, isn't it? No you know, testing you, as well. Yeah, that's a big thing. No, I mean, I mean, will that hindrance him doing that? Do you think, in your opinion, will that one hindrance him for this weekend? Um, or? I don't know. Hopefully not. Yeah. Oh God, I hopefully not. Of course, I. Um, it is. It's completely different. Mm. I think it was only about one point eight off when he the fastest. Yeah. And no, just with, within two seconds, I think was credible. I I actually said I reckon he'll finish around twentieth, twenty first, and if he does that, it's a good job, and that's that's, that's where he got you know. So there we are. Um, you just need time on them bikes. Yeah. I mean, Jake's in his fourth season now. You know. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's time. Yeah. And getting used to it, and he had to learn tires and a stiff chassis and everything, you know. Yeah. So I think yeah, he did a really good job. He did a really good job. Yeah. Proper nice lad, Rory. I think mm. he, he does deserve an opportunity. I think he can be a good Grand Prix rider because yeah, I used to watch him when he was on the Red Bull rookies and things, and he was so dominant. Mm. And um, it was a shame he didn't get the break then. Mm. Obviously, he came here, and, and don't me wrong, he's had, he had a great year in Super Sport, didn't he? Dominated that, didn't oh, he? Oh, he was born, and then, born, and then, born. And then a great debut year on a Superbike last year. Yeah. So he has got bags of talent. He's just hope he hasn't missed them three years because he could have been in GPs at 16, 17 mm-hmm. from the Red Bull rookies, but he's still only, is he 19 or 20? Something around he's still young yeah, to young enough to go 20, there yeah. and get a career there, I think. so. Um, and in terms of yourself this year, obviously working with Max Ingham, lad from the Isle of Man, mm-hmm. and uh, very inexperienced in road racing, very good motocross racer, mm-hmm. but he came across and he's only been on the top. Uh, is this his second year on the tarmac? So it's only his second year. First year of British Championship. Yeah, second straight, year of racing, yeah, yeah. straight into British Super Sport. And um, I guess for you, it's been compared to working in GPs and all mm-hmm. the rest of it. It's um, you pro- you're not used to being like tucked away in a little tent in the in the paddock. Mm. But uh, I bet it's been like, quite sort of refreshing start. Yeah, it's been actually. enjoyable because I've I've been able to bring my lad Brad along, so he's my lead mechanic now, um, and he was basically oh, hold. He's nineteen. Um, but he was holding the fort for the last two years when I was stuck in Europe with COVID. He was building engines and looking after customers. So his his apprenticeship went so fast, you know. What, he's, what, what, what age was he when he first built his first engine then? Brad? Yeah. Um, he was quite young. He was building his motocross bikes and things when he was riding at like 13 and stuff. So that's cool. Cool. Just, just top ends, pistons and things. It you doesn't know, matter, so. that's class. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, and like I say, Max doing a great yeah. job. And he's... Yeah, and it is. It's refreshing, to be fair. It's, it's, it's laid back. There's no pressure. No. It, 
the the thing with Grand Prix is it is it's high intense in it, you know, and there's a lot of pressure on, and 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 this is just this is just it, it it's just brought racing back to being fun again, you know, and and I've really enjoyed it this year, and it, and it's good teaching and developing Max because he's so raw. Yeah, he he you, you know, can mould it like he yeah. hasn't got many bad habits. You can kind of yeah. mould him here. Yeah. So did he meet Max through the motocross? I knew event? him through the motocross, yeah. So he basically Instagrammed me in December and just said, oh, you're not with Dixon. Do you fancy doing British <laughs> Championship? Like Sent like laughing faces back. like, And he's like, no, no, I'm being serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> and he's like, hell? yeah. So I says, okay, well, what, what are you doing? So he says, um, we've already ordered some bikes off, off MSS, some Kawasaki's, they're being built, and we've got all the motor, everything you can get on them, but we don't know how to operate it. So I made some phone calls. I spoke to Nick and Nick says, yep, yeah, they've ordered the bikes, the, the, the paid for, they come in. And, and I spoke to Angus and said, what 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 have you put on Max's bikes? And he said, they've just ordered everything you can get, you know, so so the bikes were up to scratch. So I, um, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And then made some more phone calls, got some information and managed to get all Jack's data from last year. So that's good now because when I come to a meeting, I can already do Max's gear pattern show him what he should do and then straight after a session overlay it and show him where he's going wrong and you know just teach him really mm -hmm. so we've got the perfect tools to teach him so yeah, hopefully we can bring him on really fast you know mm -hmm. so but they, we, we get, like you know bear in mind like you say you knew him through the motocross element and to be blunt if he was a spoiled brat if he was a spoiled brat would you work with him um got, you know what i mean was it if he was a, a little shit would you have gone? Well, you're not in the position where you're... No, nah, because you I, was be quite, I was quite happy to take a year off, to be fair. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, or do what I was doing, because we had a, a few movie projects coming up, so I, know, so I know that we're going to take up a lot of time. Um, and the MJW business side, it, it's, it's flat. To be fair, with me coming home this year, I thought, oh, so much time at home. It just cannot take a day off. It's just so busy, you know, yeah. so, which is good. Yeah, got, you know? um, I've got a pretty talented family as well because uh, Max is like, m is he multi British champion, I think, and multi Motocross, Motocross, yeah. right? And uh, his, his sister is like, she's like world class um, dressage and other horses and like multi show jumping, she's won dressage. like loads of cross country she does, yeah. Uh, like Jesus. either British or European championships yeah. and she, like does that all around the world. Yeah, she's That's a competitive family, that isn't it? That is a competitive <laughs> yeah, she's, family. She's close to, um, Riding for Great Britain in the next Olympics. Yeah, yeah, mm. she's really good. I bet Christmas is hard around there. What have you won <laughs> this <laughs> year? Uh, yeah, Mon Monopoly. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, lovely, lovely family, and yeah, uh, yeah proper, doing a good job. Mm. Uh, in terms of the future, is there any? In terms of uh, racing, is there anything that you would like to tick off the box, or is there a particular championship or particular person or team that you'd like to to work with? Um. I think six months ago, I'd probably had a few ambitions in in Grand Prix still to, right. you know, to stay there and actually work like properly in a Moto GP team. You know, not Moto Two or Moto Three, because I've done five hundred Grand Prix and and two months in a Moto GP team. But actually, since leaving the paddock with the travel and and everything, um, I actually got no intention of, of going back to that paddock now. Right. You know what I mean? I'm pretty much I've done it so. I'm quite happy just to focus on my business or or, or just mm -hmm. do a bit of British Championship, maybe go would back you, and do the roads. Would you right? ever be interested in having your own team, like getting sponsors in and like actually owning the team? <laughs> yeah, um, no. I all the stress now. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did it oh, in, in motocross. Um, I ran a Kawasaki adult team and a youth team for three years and we won um, 250 British Championship for Kawasaki. Um, and it, yeah, it was awful. Never again. Just de <laughs> just just dealing with schoolboy dads and things, and yeah, it was uh, it was it's so just... time consuming. It were uh, I'd never run a team again. Yeah, do you know? Um, from not my the, own. For, yeah, no. from all mm. the times that you were in, in GPs, um, I'm not sure if like you got to much. Um, if you got to like see the budgets and stuff, but do you know, uh, if if someone wanted to like say, right, I want to start a Moto Three team right now, and I want like. <sighs> like the running cost for the full season mm. do you know what's roughly what it's about it's about to do to do it right properly yeah, is about one one and a half million to do motor two three. riders yeah and right. then motor two is about two and a half to three wow what a game. and then motor gp i think i think we had some like 16 million budget to do that right so it was quite a lot yeah let's let's keep going down if we can worlds world superbike 
how much do you think what budget would you need for I don't that? Know super, I don't know super bikes because um you have to build the bikes and that, don't you? Yeah. So there's quite a lot of money that goes into mm -hmm. that where a lot of the GP bikes are on the shelf, you just you just purchase them, you know. So I would say si I'd say similar to Motor Three. Right. Yeah. You'd you need competitively at least a couple of million, I reckon. Yeah, I was gonna say I think it would be I mean you could I reckon that doing BSP. Super you could, Sport you could probably do it for about eight hundred and fifty thousand, I reckon. Right. World, World Super Bikes. Sport. Mm. Yeah. BSB. This is all Theoretical now, yeah. To do a, I was about to say, what you tell yeah, me? To do, it, to do it properly, uh, uh, to do it properly as a two-man team, I think you would need about seven hundred. You'd need at least seven hundred, I'd say, yeah. yeah. To do it proper, you could do it for about two hundred and fifty, but you're competing against people that's got three yeah. times your budget, and that's essentially. Yeah, like, you're like you're never gonna, yeah, be in the top three, are you? You've, you know. Let, yeah. Let's keep playing this game. Let's keep playing this game. So, if you took a notion, all of a sudden, go, I want to go and do. Northwest TD in a full Irish scene. How much budget would you put? No, yeah. you know what? You'd be the person asking. No, that, not really. That's what you, I'm, that's what I'm a wing of a prep mate. I spend money and don't think like I'm just singing. Just get also to the these next these sort of questions. Questions. But you know what I mean. You'd, I'm just, you'd still much... you'd still need a lot of money because where, where, where you where where a lot of your budget is is obviously is obviously travel, accommodation, food, yeah. and staff. That was that was always Patronus's biggest. You know they had fifty two members to pay, wow. and you know, if if you, if logistics for it, that that's your running cost. Once once yeah. you've built bikes, you know you're only really on crash damage, tires, fuel. But even even to you know do the TT proper, you, you know you need quite a few personnel. You have got to pay them to be over there, and it all just mounts up, doesn't it? Yeah. You, you, you're still going to need properly at least hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand just just to do that program that you yeah. said, you know, mm -hmm. correct, you know. So. It's mental, isn't it? Yeah. It's mental. Really. There's a lot of money Class. in it. So we'll um, have some patron questions, so I'll, uh, I'll get them up. <laughs> is, any, is any rider that, because we've, we've been zigzagging across mm. the career, is there anyone of no, like notable, notable that we've missed off in the in your careers so far? Who was, is anyone that you worked with in the Red Bull Rookies? That was just a total shame that never got a chance. You know, you thought that lad there should have had his chance. That we don't know of here, that we haven't heard. Um obviously Jonathan Ray and Eugene, you've seen where, where they went from the Red Bull Rookie yeah, exactly, program. Yeah. Um young Chris Jones, he was an amazing talent. Right. He he would have gone all the way into Grand Prix, that kid. He was unbelievable. It was just such, such a shame. We were only, I think, we were only thirteen years old, mm -hmm. and and into his half a year of British Championship racing, it were. On, yeah, he stole at um, Cadwell, Cadwell Park, Park on, the, yeah. on the start line, and unfortunately yeah. got killed. And yeah, that's, he stole. And that's right. when the kind of fell off the bike and then got run over and killed, oh, unfortunately. Yeah. At, um, right. At Cadwell, you know, when they do the, they've stopped doing it now, but they used to do the Chris, bicycle race. Yeah, Chris and things, Jones, yeah. the race on a night time where everyone yeah. gets dressed up. That was to raise money for yeah. his charity. Um, but yeah, I was he only thirteen at the time? Yeah. Jesus, right. 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 Um, yeah, I think that was two thousand and five. Were it? Yeah. It'd have been around that time. Yeah, yeah. two thousand. Few Patreon questions. Uh, on, sorry, uh, like, is there is there anyone being like not Red Bull rookies? Anyone that you've met, like, just lazy? And what I mean by that is someone who could just was so unbelievably skilled on a bike, but they weren't bothered. Have you ever come across? You don't have to name them, but have you ever come across anyone? Yeah, like that? John McGuinness. <laughs> <laughs> right? He, 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 he never trained or did anything. No, did he? that's just, it. Yeah. Just, just Naturally. bags of talent, yeah. yeah. But but John's but, but, but a good, good lad. John John's like a legend in yeah, the sport, yeah, isn't he? But yeah, I yeah. just mean like you know it's you know, even even in his early days though, you know when he was coming good. through the two fifties and um, just yeah, quite lazy. Do you know if, <laughs> out, of, out of all the riders that you've worked with, so and you can include the ones that have unfortunately passed away. Mm. If you could, um, if you could pick five of them to go for like a week's week in Vegas. Which five would you pick? Yeah, Jones would definitely be top of the list because yeah. he were a top lad. Um, Dixon's a good crack. Is he? Yeah, yeah, he is. To be fair, um, right. let me think. Dixon, Eugene, he's he's good when he's had a drink. <laughs> when he's had a drink, <laughs> drinking that before the flight, son. Get on it. Uh, Two more. Yeah, I think I think Rutter would be quite entertaining. To be fair, last um, one. Last one. Let me think. 
Um, I think we'll probably throw John in there just for his banter and crap because <laughs> he is funny, isn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah, he's, he's got yeah, crack, And yeah. he has got some stories. So, yes. yeah. uh, so first question, Tony Rolls, where do you see racing in 10 years' time? With electric coming through, will that make yeah. your job easier or harder? Yeah, no, um, probably make my business harder because yeah. I'll not be able to tune them. Um, <laughs> probably yeah. for longer. I, it, it's coming, it's just when. Um, it's just not quite there yet, is it? But in 10 years, years, it might saying be. That if, years, saying though, that yeah. you said about the breakthrough on the film using electric bikes without yeah. the thing, so maybe that's a new yeah. business venture that we, you can get into. We, we, we use electric bikes purely for the, um, there's no sound and less mm-hmm. vibration for the cameras mounted and that. Yeah. So Are you sponsored by an electric bike company? No, but we're currently um, in some meetings with Stark. Um, hopefully, Hold on, mate, hopefully, Tony I'm... Stark. <laughs> no, do you know Stark, the electric <laughs> right. motocross bike? All oh, right, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're hoping to become like the one of the main UK distributors of that, and also um, that's the particular bike we want to use in a lot of up and coming movies. You know, so we're already closely talking to them mm. in Very triumph cool. of bought i yes yeah, you know yeah, the little yeah. kids trials bikes have and it. stuff like yeah, yeah, yeah triumph have, yeah. bought them out right mm. that's interesting you know, and then like you say no and they're jumping down the rabbit hole in the electric element as well so yeah, well, yeah. it is it's coming can, it is coming like mm. damn it um ryan to you, how did you find working with guy martin sort of covered up yeah like i say it was good loved it yeah yeah he weren't he isn't how he comes across in that movie if you know what i mean Mm. Um, a lot of that was for the movie. Yeah. Um, he is quite normal, to be fair. There we are. Mm. Uh, Jess Mortimer, is there anything you have wanted to try with a race bike and the factory have said a flat out no to? With that in mind, do you think there are loopholes, lack of clarity in the rules that teams are exploiting? I like the first part of that question. So the is there been things in the past where you've been like mega confident that that's the way to go with the bike, but then like the the big wigs at the factory have said no. Um, sometimes yeah, but like mainly work the the closest factory I've worked with with, with Honda in the Motor Three. The the way that the rules are homologated and stuff. Um, whatever's in the part book is all you can use. So ah. if Honda don't bring it, they may you can introduce stuff and they'll bring it the year after. But that specific year, they 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 won't. You can't introduce it. Mm. Um, and the Honda's been quite good to work with. There was we were. We tried some stuff with the KTM in 15, which was probably the end of that question where we were, um, I wouldn't call it cheating, but we were, we were like bending the rules. Um, but KTM found that out and, and we had to remove what we, was, we were doing from the bike. So, yeah. Yeah. So, but they liked the idea. I sat, I sat in a meeting with a couple of bosses from KTM. They liked the idea. They then introduced it in their engine the year after. So, right. you know, it was, um, we, we, we're doing it before we're allowed to and yeah you know Good. we got done for it but mm-hmm. development's to, development there yeah to, sort of. um another question i, I like sort of like this one on it so andy h how do you deal with riders who think they know more than than they do about setups etc sort of to add on to that have you um have you had many riders that uh you've like just they think they know too much and you can't like they're they're not re- they're not listening to what you're saying because they think they know it all. Um, Max, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've ever really experienced that. A lot, a lot of working with a rider is just is respect in it. Once you've got that rider's respect, I, I guess it doesn't matter what you tell them. Mm-hmm. They, they can they believe you, don't they? And they, they want to work with you. So um, I've always been fortunate enough to to have a good relationship with my rider. So I've never really had one that's that sort of, you know overruled or anything I think when I first joined um, that Ilmore team and I was put with McWilliams I was so nervous because I was I was still quite raw at being a crew chief and going straight to MotoGP and with uh, Jeremy's background I just thought I'm just going to get destroyed here but actually I had a great relationship working with Jeremy and, and we was analysing so many things in the day that he, he was being educated as well you know and it was it was really good so yeah, I've never really been in a position where I've had a rider that's, you know, been like that, to be fair. So. And last one, Kathy jones Parry is he single? With a laughing face. <laughs> <laughs> and then said, uh, well, you asked for questions. No, seriously, if you could make one change to the sport to improve <laughs> the rules, uh, set up anything, what would it be and why? So I think um, you've got a fan there as well. The rules. Um... <laughs> 
hasn't answered the first All right, question. No, I'm saying, I think, so you've, got, I think like... you've got a fan there. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pass on the details afterwards. And I'm, just gonna... I'm, I'm divorced, but I have got a girlfriend. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. So, um, so, sorry, Kathy. <laughs> just a little bit late. I missed that part. Now, um, Class. Rules. I don't know. I, I'd love to change the Moto 3 rules. Really? I'd love, I'd, yeah, I'd love Freddie Spencer's job. Right. And what, I, and what would you, what would you change? Just... Um, I change how they qualify. Um, it, it breaks your working in that environment, you know, where they all need a tow because it's because it's so beneficial on a little bike. Mm. You can gain over one second a lap just following someone, um, you know, and all that weight in, and it's it's difficult. I'd I definitely do something to try and stop all that. Like a, a um, super pole element kind of thing. Yeah, we, did, we spoke about super pole, but. Um, the time you're given, um, they won't do it because it takes up too much time. And MotoGP is the is the main show. But yeah, of course. I'd have something like some sort of traffic light system at the bottom of pit lane. So maybe for the last ten minutes, uh, say the last five minutes, you're not allowed to enter the pit. Once once the pit lane shut, it's shut. So you've got to get out within five minutes. And I'd have them all come into the bottom and have them on a traffic light system and just start ten seconds, send one, you know, send one, and then and then go back on the sectors so they can't catch each other up and if you're late getting out your box and you miss that light and it goes red you don't get out you know mm. i'd try and separate them all quite, for five minutes and let them out there on their own and, and quite crack uns- on you know unsafe at times isn't it um sp- speaking of the british riders coming through like the young british riders coming mm-hmm. through in mortal three so we've got scott ogden and josh watley mm-hmm. um do you think that e- either or both of them have the potential to yeah i think um josh is still young he's mm-hmm. 16 um he still has a lot to learn um, as long as he keeps his focus and his head down, going into next year, I think Josh will show a lot more potential. And I think Scott's done an amazing job so far. I mean, um, to be picking regular points up and doing what he's doing, um, I know that paddock, how, how difficult it is. And I think Scott's done a really good job. I think he's already done enough to warrant himself a, a career in that paddock, you know. So, yeah, good, good ride yeah. for next year. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, he's good. Mint. Yeah, class. Um, have you got anything else to wrap? Things? No, I just uh, thank you very much. Um, you've uh, wh- how long have you listened to our podcast? By the way, he's never listened to one. Um, quite a lot, really, because like I was saying, we've got like a big TV in the workshop, and um, and mainly my my lad Brad would put it on. So obviously, I'm not forced to listen to them, but I do Cheers, enjoy Brad. listening to them. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we've probably seen every single one um, that you started televising if you know yeah, what I mean. they, they started just as you two doing a pod didn't they but yeah. when you started bringing guests on yeah. that's probably when we started watching it i think so we'll, we'll, i think we'll what's been the worst one <laughs> the worst one yeah that's a bit of a stick um, I, love it. I don't think there's been any bad ones but some people that you don't know um yeah because they're on in the background i just yes. focus more on what i'm doing and maybe not listen yeah fair do, you have a, do you have a favorite um I like some of the Christine Eden ones. The Tommy Hill one were good. I like the Ron Aslam one. Um, yeah, there's been some good ones. Is there anyone that, you before recommend? you've listened, you thought that they're a bell end, but then you watched <laughs> it and you thought, actually, they're all right? Um, <laughs> I think there is, but, I, but, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not, not saying I can't well. remember, but I remember, yeah. I remember like thinking, oh, I've got to watch this one. And it was actually an entertaining one. So oh, that's I, good. I can't, I'll, I'll think of it were. Chrissy, yeah, let's no, pretend to end the show now. Yeah. Oh, so they were able to be, who was that person? Mm. But, um, <laughs> so next, uh, next podcast we do, we'll actually, well, we might do one here at Thruxton tomorrow. We'll have to see how we're going for time. But, um, and then Dom's out to the Isle of Man next week. So mm-hmm. very best of luck with all of that. Yeah. And um, hey, good luck for tomorrow. Yeah, Jesus, we're going. So, uh, we're this is, this is Friday night, so we've got a qualifying and a race for me tomorrow. FP3 in the morning, and then we've got two two races Sunday. Looking forward. What about yourself? What What's your two. time table tomorrow? We're qualifying tomorrow tomorrow morning about 11, and then we have a sprint race in the evening, and then a, a normal race on Sunday. So. There we are. Happy days. Well, good luck to the pair of you. I'll be, I'll be watching yeah, in you. jealousy. Yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> just a few quick things to wrap things up. So uh, over on Lee Johnson's YouTube channel, uh, the um, he's doing a thing linked with Bennett's where you can win a bike. He's like rebuilt this bike and um, I think they're giving it away to a customer so if you head over there i'm not sure what you have to do either like there'll be some sort of link but if you check that out and a massive thank you to our sponsors colchester kawasaki and to all of our patrons 
I'm, I'm sure. Oh, I tell you what, I have got. Uh, I made a note on my phone. Well, while you're doing that, I think yeah, you need. On. I think you need to do a massive shout out to uh, your boss, Luke, go on. for your aircon system that we haven't mm. had on, like a portable aircon for this weekend. Yeah, Jesus, you're not going to see me move from that. I'm Which not is watching needed it. this weekend. My giddy aunt, <laughs> one minute. Um, my giddy aunt. One of the things I, I made a few notes on my phone. One of them was um, that our good friend Lundy, who kitted this. Um, this trailer out has uh, hung his leathers up, so oh, yeah. he's uh, had his last race. And I've got another one from one of our friends, Jim Travers, and um, he said, "Hi, Chrissy. I was wondering if you would be able to do me a favour, please. You've probably seen I'm taking inspiration from James Hillier, and I've I've bought myself a Honda C90, and I'm riding it in November from John O'Groats to Land's End in under 24 hours. I'm doing it to mark the 10th, 10th anniversary of my eldest son's open heart surgery at Birmingham Children's Hospital, and I'm doing it in aid of BCH and also Great Almond Street Hospital, where he's currently recovering from life changing surgery. The favour was hoping for. Would you please be able to mention my challenge on the podcast and maybe share the Facebook page?" Uh, please a couple of times before I do the ch- the challenge. Uh, I'm fund funding the whole challenge, so every penny of the donations goes to the charities, and I'll I'll stick the link on the awesome. On the yeah, thing. Player. And he also sent uh, this of uh, I think there is kids of the Domino Bomb. I'll put that picture on as well, but it's cool. It's a lovely picture. Right, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I hope it's good that little man's when, making a recovery. Yeah, yeah that's send that. When, best, when's best he doing it? Um, you wouldn't want to do it this weekend, would you? No, you'd be Messy. sweating. Better, better than the rain. Um, <laughs> well, you're like a tune C nineties. You can help him along with that challenge. Yeah. There you go. Just get uh, it singing is it? I can't, I, it, There is a page on Facebook. Okay. Um, I can't see a date. No, but like you say, we'll get we'll get it shared anyway. Mm. We'll get it shared and then the answer the answer will come. Exactly, it'll come. But um, fabulous. Well, um, awesome. thanks very much for your Perfect. time, brains. And, yeah, no uh, problem. Look, all the best for the rest of the season. Look forward to catching up sometime soon. All right. See you a bit, lad. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chasing the racing. Powered by Colchester Kawasaki. Part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles.